Welcome to our monthly Writer's Lunch. I'm thrilled to have you all here for our casual and virtual brown bag lunch, which we hold on the third Friday of each month. Expect engaging discussions on craft, informal presentations covering various forms of writing, and of course, excellent conversation. Today, we're delving into how our ecological awareness influences our writing and vice versa a topic that beautifully aligns with Garden Month in April and Earth Day, which is coming up on Monday, April 22nd. I'm Nico Chen, your program manager here at Mechanics Institutes. To our returning members, it's wonderful to see you again in our virtual space. And for those who are new to this gathering, a warm welcome to you. Established in 1854, Mechanics Institute stands as one of San Francisco's most vibrant literary and cultural hubs nestled in the heart of the city. Housing a comprehensive general interest library, an internationally renowned chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and the esteemed cinema lit film series, we pride ourselves on being dubbed the coolest library in downtown San Francisco and a sanctuary for remote work, as highlighted in a recent piece by the San Francisco Standard. Experience the magic of Mechanics Institute firsthand by joining us for a free tour every Wednesday at noon. This month, as we celebrate also National Poetry Month, we have a couple of exciting events lined up to close out April. On Monday, April 29th, join us in our picturesque fourth floor meeting room at noon for Poems of Chinese Exclusion, a part of our Monday Noontime History series. Renowned poet and writer, Jeffrey Thomas Leong will present fresh translations of poems penned by Chinese immigrant detainees on Angel Island, alongside readings from his own original poetry inspired by these works. In the evening, tune in online for No Poetry, No Peace, where we'll showcase a fantastic lineup of poets, some local, some from afar, exploring how poetry fosters creative and cathartic expressions and peace. The title, No Poetry, No Peace, as you can see here, is drawn from a collection by Cheryl J. Bouzet Boutet and her daughter, Angela Boutte. And I also wanted to share the cover of um, the other work that we will be highlighting during National Poetry Week by Jeffrey Thomas Leung. During our discussion today, we invite you to participate in a Q&A session. Simply drop your questions into the chat box and I'll be sure to address them during the latter half of our Writer's Lunch today. And don't forget to mark your calendars for our next Writer's Lunch on Friday, May 17th, where we'll be exploring the theme of Crafting Books and Stories for Children and Youth with Lisa, Lisa Brown, Lodian Champion, and Oliver Chin. This event will be moderated by the one and only Cheryl J. Bizet Boutet. Before we get started today, I also want to do a quick uh, land acknowledgement. Um, this is a land acknowledgement for children, actually, um, designed by the San Francisco Public Library. And this also allows for us to also engage with our bodies and also the um, ecology around us. We might not be outside, but actually our walls, right? Our um, home spaces are actually also part of our ecology in some way. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and um, raise our hands into the sky and um, also like um, just say, here is the sky and reach up to the sky. Here is the land and touch the ground, if you can manage to do that. And also put your hand out to your friends and say, here are my friends. And then hug yourself and say, here am I. We stand together hand in hand and thank the Ramatush Ohlone here in, the, uh, in San Francisco, the traditional caretakers of this land, this land on which we like to play. We promise to look after it every day. Thank you all once again for joining us. Let's dive into an enriching discussion. Cheryl, go ahead and take us away. All right. Um, thank you all for being here and especially thank you, Viola, Kevin, and Obi. I'm so glad that you have joined us today. Um, I'm going to start with the question that we kind of talked about before uh, we got started here today. Uh, and I'll start with you, Kevin. What sparked your interest in writing about ecology? Really, uh, it all began with plants, of course, and, and um, my love of plants that turned into a career. And speaking about plants and sharing the stories behind them, every, every plant there's a story uh, behind it and uh, places and people and history 
-hmm. and the future and my passion for sharing those stories was such uh, that I wanted to put it on paper and write about plants and uh, that's my biggest passion to be able to share share my ideas and my knowledge and experience uh, through my books. Wonderful. How about you, Viola? Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, Cheryl, as you know, I write about food. Um, right. Not, and so right. I, I yeah. write about eating plants, <laughs> not yes. necessarily growing them. <laughs> Um, but I would say that, that my ecological awareness in my writing has to do very much with the uh, with the semantics and the etym etymology of the word ecology, which comes from oikos, which in, in Greek means home, and logos, which is uh, the word and, and the truth. And so I think of ecology, um, ecological awareness, not just as the awareness of the land that we all share, but also in a smaller way in, in our own land and our own home and how we make sure that we keep it as sustainable and as in touch as possible with what is going on outside. So my own ecological awareness is um, making sure that you eat all parts of either the plant or animal that you're working with, as well as making sure that you um, purvey in the best way possible, that you, we all try to... Uh, um, gain sovereignty back over our food. And that, that is the work that I uh, do with my writing and my teaching about food. Wonderful. How about you, Ob um, I'm sorry. Yeah, how about you, Obi? Uh, good morning. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, Kevin, I, I had this book on my shelf for, oh. for <laughs> a, 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 quite, quite some time now. I'm a big wow. fan of your work. I'm happy Thank to you. be in conversation with you. Right, right. I'm honored. <laughs> Hey, you know, uh, uh, yeah, ecological awareness. I, 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 I appreciate the combination of those words. Ecological consciousness. How, how do we address so uh, successfully navigate rather this 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 bottleneck uh, that well, we what, have found what's... ourselves into on in the twenty first century is is core to my work and my vision. This this right. balancing of. Uh, poetry and policy and so much science communication. Uh, my father was an astrophysicist. I have I have a lot more. And Dr. Kaufman's son was going to be a mathematician. Of course, now I'm a painter uh, and a naturalist. Uh, but I have more training in math than I do in art. And and I still see reality through that lens of, of complex systems, evidence, and eloquence uh, that, that the language of math affords. And translating that into systems theory across these, these big books I write about natural history uh, and as, as, as it exists inside the biodiversity and physiography of the California floristic province, which is the the target and the subject of of my passion and my vocation i uh, uh am astounded every day to to realize that that the more uh the i i mean i could paint 100 maps a day for the rest of my life and never tell the whole story that i wanted to tell it's like some sort of magic well that i'm drawing water from the more the more water i draw the more water there is to drink and uh i i I, I, I see that with, with the potentially infinite amount of relationships inside the ecology of the world. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm actively involved in, in the mythopoetic process, mythopoesis, the idea of like creating the reality across the land, that creating the relationship that we want uh, uh, in terms of uh, some sort, some sort of, of, of narrative construct. I think uh, I, I stumbled across yeah. a definition of what ecology was the other day uh, from Frank Herbert, who gave us Dune, you know, the most popular movie in the world right now. Uh, he says, he says, uh, ecological science is the study of consequences. And I think that that is, uh, is, is a wonderful uh, a bit of inspiration, perhaps even a framework to, to this ongoing discussion here. Totally agree. Um, and Ecology, uh, you know, is also defined as uh, the relationship of organisms to one another and their environment and how 
they interact. And so when you say consequences, I mean, what do you end up with at the end of that statement, right? You end up with the consequences of it. So that's, that's right. We're we're not we're no we're no particular agent is in isolation, right? It's right. it's all ripples in the pond. And so, uh, and so ecology echoes. ecology is really everything. It's everything. So exactly. Yeah. So so uh, let me continue with you, Obi. Um, how do you, in broad strokes, uh, since this is really crafts for writers, how do you? Uh, meld living things to their environment? How do you, what are some of the relationships that you use in your writing? Um, how, do you, how do you bridge all of these things together? Do you, what are your techniques? I, 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 would, I would argue that, that, that ecology is not everything. Ecolo ecology actually is a very rare phenomenon inside of the universe. It, 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 only, it only happens on this, this thin, this thin veneer across this, as far as we know, we only have one data set as far, you know, in the, in the, in the whole of, you know, cosmologic phenomena, we, ecology only exists in the system that James Lovelock so, so right, rightly, in my estimation, called Gaia theory, which is, which is that for the past several billion years, life has constructed itself in such a way across the planet. So now there is this relationship between um, uh, homeostatic forces that life has constructed and perpetuates in order to foster its own increasing complexity. And uh, I think that that is a, uh, e even even in the days when we're, we're, we're faced so much with, with sort of the word, the word, the word, uh, you know the noises, uh, the, the noises that we 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 uh, make to conceptualize something like the end of the world, right? Which which is which is uh, not something that nature ever does. You know, here we are, uh, you know, arguably in inside of already this this sixth mass extinction, um, and yet and yet and yet there will be a seventh mass extinction. There very well might be a thirteenth mass extinction. Uh, a billion years from now, right? So, so there's we are in the very center of, in the middle of the great epic of life on Earth, and there's very little we can do about that. And I don't find that to be a, a gloomy thought at all. I, I, I uh, to the contrary, I think that's a very hopeful thought, and joyful even. Yeah, in in my way of thinking, that our relationship and how our relationship to everything around us that is living is everything. Very I mean, good, very good. That's and, where and, I come. From. And, 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 as so, a, and as, go ahead. As as a as a fundamentally, I'm a grower of plants and uh, a lover of nature. But my career has been involved in um, in in producing and growing plants, uh, both ornamental and edible. But um, ecological awareness uh, was first coined in the um, late 1800s, and 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 it was exactly as you mentioned, Cheryl, uh, about how living organisms interact with each other in the soil and on the surface mm -hmm. and, and in every respect. And, um, and I can very much relate to that as, as a grower because that's how my mind has to work, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, to make sure that I have all the elements in line aligned to be able to grow plants. And, and, and as an extension of that, I've always found, especially with my writing, um, ecological awareness is much more than that to me it's it's awareness of each other and right and and as i said every tree and every plant has a story behind it and uh and often those stories are, are sad and distressing um and uh and but we have to we have to you know re reflect on on uh, the past and look to the future but also um make sure we're using the right terms and being respectful to to one another because to me uh you know plants and where they come from around the world opens up a so much more uh about the people and the places and the culture and the history and plants have been a gateway for me to just so much more from uh from history to to the wooden satellites i don't know if you've heard but uh the japanese are specializing in using um uh, wood, wooden parts in satellites now so that they burn up on re-entry and are less uh, polluting. Um, so that's fascinating to me that ancient trees like magnolia, for example, um, that evolved before 
bees and so pollinated by mm. um, beetles uh, are the, uh, the favored word for using in satellites so uh, so mm. it, it's just fascinating and, and that's and that's been my joy to be able to share uh, such stories and information such such inspiration for you for your writing uh, how about you Viola well, you know, I have a much smaller and close to home inspiration. And I would say that for me, one of the major shifts in inspiration that inspired me, not just um, inspire even more ecological awareness than I had, and uh, also the desire to share such ecological awareness was motherhood. Because all of a sudden you have a child and the, uh, um, the idea and the need to keep uh, their environment as, as clean and long lasting as possible becomes paramount, right? I'm almost 58, so I figure I have another 25 good years, but he has he has much longer than that. He still has in front of him more than he does behind him. And so I find it my duty to do what I can to, um, to teach him and to also give the tools to him and to his generation to be more in touch with their environment. For me, there's nothing uh, that does that as much as food, right? I mean, food is right. your, your right. own tiny ecosystem, your own um, home ecology, and, and really keeps you in touch with the other organisms in your environment, where the other organisms are also the other human beings, and not just the trees, but also the trees, and also um, your relationship with animals and with, with every other living organism that is in your environment, be it a, a wood, you know, be it a, a countryside, be it, be it in the city, be it whatever it is. But food is always a great tool to um, to keep things going as long as possible, and in the best way. So, Viola, let's stay on let's stay on the um, the organism uh, subject yeah. for just a moment. So, what is the most unique or interesting organism you have written about, and uh, what did you say about it, and how how did you find it? So I, what I write about, and as you know, as you know, I have um, thousands of recipes, but only one book. So um, what I like to write about are um, in the Italian kitchen, which is my field of expertise. My book is on the ingredients that are the cornerstones of Italian cooking, is writing about um, how the um, ingenuity of Italian cooks really makes for a del delicious, delicious economy and ecology of the kitchen. I would say that among all the ingredients that I have in my book, the one that is the most interesting for me from the standpoint is the caper bush. So the huh. caper bush, first of all, is sturdy. Um, you can plant a little caper bush on a wall and in not so long a time, it will just come out. All it needs is a lot of sun. Um, and so, you know, we've always so far thought of capers as like these tiny little buds that we eat and they're very yeah. delicious and we can conserve them in different way and then we eat them. But really in a caper bush, you can eat essentially everything. So the caper is just the bud before it becomes a flower. Um, you can eat it at different stages. So the tinier it is, the tinier it is and the more expensive it is because obviously it takes more to pick it and to keep it. Um, and then as it grows and kind of becomes a little um, open and almost coquettish in the way that it uh, that it uh, um, presents itself to the world, um, then it gets cheaper and cheaper on our plate because now it's kind of past its prime. Um, it gets to a point that then it becomes a flower and flowers are also eaten in cooking. Um, they're not transported to the States, but um, Italian chefs are using flowers of capers quite a bit. Um, it, it's got, by the way, the caper flower is st astounding. It is kind of like a, a kind of like a buttery white and a little satiny, and it has this like bright pink plumage in the middle. So it's really beautiful to eat, but also to look at. Um, after that's done, then there is a further another uh, thing, which is what we call the caper berry. So the berry is the last face, and it's full of seeds, and it's also a little bit almost like a uh, um, like a little gherkin, like a little cornichon. And it's quite tasty. You can also eat that. It's got its use in the kitchen, but you can also eat the fr the leaves of capers. You can take pick them up and eat them at different again at different stages. They're shaped like hearts, like very soft and beautiful hearts with a with a rounded tip. 
and you can get them when they're really small and you can use them in a salad or as they grow, they get a little stronger. And so then you have to cook them. You can cook them with wine. Um, you can pickle them. You can deep fry them. Um, and then you go back and there will be more and more and more. So the, huh. caper, the, the caper bush is very fructiferous. I mean, it, you know, it goes on doing its thing for a very, very long time. And if you want to kill a caper bush, you really have to work on it. You can't just, <laughs> like, you know, you take it out and you think it's gone, but it's not. It's going to come, come out before. The only thing it needs is sun. So uh, to me, I probably, in terms of an organism that, that is interesting and has like so many applications in the world, um, in the world about which I write, I would say the caper bush is the most interesting. It's, it's almost like you wrote a story about your friend, the caper bush. Let me yes. introduce my friend, the caper bush, and tell yes. you all about it. I love it. Yes, I'm, gonna, I'm going to write a short story about that. Now, it would work. <laughs> How about you, Kevin? Uh, well, I've, I've been, uh, Viola, be interested to know that um, I've got uh, family in uh, Malta, not far from uh, Italy or next to Sicily, of course. And so I've been collecting uh, capers uh, before with my cousins. <laughs> Um, yes. uh, in the hillside so uh, for me um, uh, marine grass uh, Zostera, Zostera marina um, is fascinating because it's it's uh, common on um, on the Atlantic coast and, and around Europe and North America um, and it's an important habitat for marine life it's actually um, it's actually a flowering plant that lives uh, about a meter under the under the uh, the the surface of the the sea and coastal waters um it doesn't get much deeper than that and uh, so it is very much on the coast um and sadly that's where it gets disturbed of course by um human activity and mm -hmm. uh and and boats and anchors and, and propellers and so on and so forth but it is an important marine habitat and um i wrote about it in um uh, my book edible the one with the bright orange color a uh, cover um mm because uh, you can actually harvest the grain from it. And it's a, a type of rice, marine rice, we're, we're calling it. Um, and actually Viola probably knows about it because uh, I believe it's an Italian chef that's, that's actually started to uh, cook and, and prepare meals with uh, marine rice. But um, Zosta Marina, that's one of my uh, favorite plants at the moment. I've, I've been um, uh, Donned the wetsuit and 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 gone looking at this uh, the habitat, and uh, as well as um, algae and you know this this is not an algae it's actually a flowering plant but at the same time looking at various edible um, uh, seaweeds uh, macroalgae of course. But um, is it born underwater, Kevin? Yeah, so Zostera marina is, is, it lives under the water, so it's I very see. unusual because all all you know plants green plants. Uh, uh climbed out of the water um and at some point um thousands of years ago the sostera marina that lived on the on the coast on the land uh, no doubt there was a, a a drought or dry period and and it decided to climb back into the ocean again hmm. and um and and that's where it is now so uh, wow. it's it's actually being grown um as a sustainable uh, crop so you can you can um you can actually grow it on the coast by using uh, channeling seawater to grow it, and, um, and 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 I'm sure it'll be a future food, which is uh, which is what edible the book is about with my uh, colleague Artisi Zerlak. So I'm I'm the plants person, and uh, my friend Arta in Austria, Vienna, um, uh, is the foodie and wrote about the flavors and the nutrition and the the uses of these uh, plant based foods. That is so fascinating. <laughs> Obi, what, what is the uh, most interesting living organism relationship you've written about? Oh, it's interesting. Well, I was just listening to Kevin and Viola talk about food. And I have just finished my sixth book, which is called The State of Fire, Why California Burns. Mm. And one of one of the one of the core areas of study for me has been has been how and why fire culture pyro. You can call them pyrodiverse economies across California have existed for thousands of years, at least uh, about six thousand years since, like you can, uh, since the San Francisco Bay formed, uh, and and native peoples of California really sort of took on their present day configuration. And it was about that time that 
the forests of California took on on their present day configuration too, mainly due to fire application on the land by yeah. human culture. And a lot of that fire application was in order to spur uh, agricultural or pyrocultural ends. And what happens when when you have these 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 uh, high intensity, low severity fires across the ground is that the ground actually gets shocked with fertilizer uh, from uh, all kinds of phosphorus and, and, and nitrogen that that uh, that make for a whole cornucopia of native plants and 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 boy is are there sophisticated menus across California of ingredients that everything from like rhizomes and tubers and bulbs to you know seeds nuts flowers forbs herbs leaves stems like the the list just goes on and on about about uh the diversity of of what sustained so many people for so long i mean you got to remember that at the time of contact there were more people living in california uh, uh than anywhere else in in uh in north america uh uh, cer certainly as many you know as many people as were living like in the in the valley of of, of central mexico and um there, there are more tribes in california too that incredible diversity led to an incredible uh ethnographic diversity of of peoples across the state there's more tribes in california than there are in the rest of in the rest of the continent um right. and and that was because of the abundant food sources and a lot of that abundancy is is because of humanity's relationships with fire well let me stay with you for a moment obi your um research process must be fascinating <laughs> how do you research what you write what what is your basic process well i i really i really try and start with the simplest questions yeah. And and it is and it is from the simplest questions that I can that that these that these books sort of unfold by themselves. Like, um, for example, my 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 third book was called uh, uh, "The Forests of California," and and I was wondering, like, okay, so we've got seventeen national forests in California. Which which where are they, and what rivers run through them? Right. As a cartographer, that seems like it should be easy information to find. And you can find those maps. They're on the, you know, United States Forest Service websites and whatnot. Uh, but they're usually 18 clicks in, they're low res, and they're not for you. Right. They're, uh, how do we how do we democratize this knowledge and democratize the landscape? You know, the books that I write are not necessarily about uh, just about the superlatives. And California has a lot of superlatives when it comes to uh, uh the natural world right we've got the the tallest forest the oldest forest the biggest trees you know all of that kind of stuff but what about what about san benito county or san joaquin county where, where and because i i know these places intimately intimately and there are there is a there is a overwhelming amount the quantity of beauty there is is uh is undeniable so how do i highlight uh all of those areas in 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 a way that expresses almost like an inventory if you will or a roll roll call of all these ecological characters around the state uh between the flora and the fauna and and the other physical sciences as well so representation on a simple level asking the simple questions about where things are what is their function their 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 quantity and their quality. And those two, balancing those two inside of, you know, the larger habitat space that is my own creative voice, which balances the, to the best of my ability anyway, the the the, the great schools of human thought and this consilient process between 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 science and art, between between uh you know uh, observable evidence and uh, aesthetic arrest how do i proceed with the truth telling that yeah. i might be able to form some sort of intellectual creative community be uh, between me as the author and my reader and uh, that that has proved uh, the most satisfying artistic endeavor that i have ever had the pleasure to to realize 
Nice. Thank you. Mm. How about you, um, Kevin? Well, how do you do your research? So um, I, oh. I amass a lot of information from uh, colleagues and friends from all around the world, of course, uh, over the years. Uh, I've been uh, in horticulture for uh, coming up for 40 years now. Um, but when I when it comes to research, uh, I I like to um, use Google Scholar, good old Google Scholar, which <laughs> yeah. is surprising. It's surprising not not so many people know about Google Scholar, um, yeah. uh, but uh, you can you can obviously use that search engine and get the, the published papers. So I'll be I'll be looking for uh, evidence of stories and legends um, and uh, uh, behind. The, the the plants and the trees that I'm writing of, and uh, I'll be looking at the ethnobotany and the uh, ethno ethno medicinal and uh, all the culinary uses, and I'll be looking for interesting stories uh, beyond the best known elements of, of of famous trees and so on and so forth. So so I very much enjoy uh, researching. I'm I'm on the circulation for many um, uh, new publications that relates to to nature and plants and so on and so forth um and you know in my lunch break uh, which isn't really a lunch break it's kind of uh, answering the call calls and emails and in, in amongst that i'm i'm uh, reading papers um that have recently been published and uh, and i just find it fascinating i don't know about uh, everybody else in the group and also listening in but um i found uh as I get older, I have a, a a bigger, bigger and bigger hunger for information and knowledge. It's insatiable. It yeah. just it just yeah. gets bigger. You just you just want to know. You want to understand. And as Obi was saying about uh, you know fires and forest fires, and uh, you know I uh, I was fascinated to study um, uh, the uh, First Nation people of uh, Australia and 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 how they managed the uh, the forests and prepare clearings so they could hunt and control burns and so on and so forth and of course eucalyptus are, have got volatile um, gases which are very flammable and and that's an evolutionary process to 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 uh, eliminate competition and and leave the ground clear for for more eucalyptus to grow but uh, just learning of the uh, first nations people and, and how they managed to control um, uh, fire and 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 indeed there, there were no uncontrolled fires or seldom it wasn't until uh, colonialism of course and uh extra trees were planted for fence posts and building and so on and so forth that yeah. uh, that got out of control just like um maui uh, hawaii and uh and the traditional uh um agroforestry essentially that, that was practiced until the land was cleared for pineapples and so on and invasive grasses took hold and 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 all of this was so much more flammable than the uh, traditional agroforestry systems that uh, have more or less disappeared. Great, thank you. And you, Viola, uh, Viola, would you hold up that beautiful book you have? Do you have it? My book, yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. isn't that beautiful, everyone? Wow, well, yes. Thank so, you. Viola, how do you do your research? I, I eat and I cook a lot. No, I'm ah! kidding. That's <laughs> that's part of what I do for sure. Uh, because uh, I, I, you know, the aim of of the book I wrote is twofold, and one is to um, for people to understand that there there are there are they have can have access to many ingredients with that have such deep flavor that make your home cooking easier. Right, you might need a little bit of time in finding in these ingredients, but once you have them in your pantry, it actually very much simplifies your cooking. So that's um, part of that's one of the missions. And then the other one is actually to get people to understand these ingredients and understand their history and why they have such deep layering of flavor, and also to make them uh, more informed consumer and better consumers. So in the second part, I would say, is where I do most of my research because, you know, once you write something, you want to make sure that it's actually okay. It's no longer about, you know, the fact that you like salt cod or the fact that you think, right. uh, you know, capers are like, the best thing ever invented and anchovies are a absolute necessity. It's also about explaining to people what, what happened, you know, how do they get there and how do they buy them? How do or how they're making sure that they're buying quality, 
in every sense, especially in the ecological sense. For me, quality is imprescindible from the ecological part because quality means that it's also done in an environment that respects every right. part of the production, in, including the human factor. So, um, so I do a lot of research. I have done a lot of research on every ingredient and I tend to go to the sources. So I speak to the producers. That's one of my first steps. I go see them. Um, I actually create connections with them. I read university papers. I go quite a bit in, you know, reading. Um, it's fascinating to see there are university papers that are based on the actual ingredient, like the facts of what it, the ingredients, what it is, and it's like uh, ecology and its history. And then there are the ones who speak about what do they look like in commerce, right? So you think it's like that, but then what is it that that once it's put on the market, what happens to it and what right. are like the, the counterfeit? So I do quite a bit of that. I have read all of the uh, production protocol of things like Parmigiano, Prosciutto, which let me tell you, they're no fun. Um, and uh, <laughs> and then the other thing that I, I love what Kevin said about the the um, um, the thirst for uh, for knowledge, which gets bigger with the number on on our uh, next to our age. So um, I I experience the same, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the more the older you are, the less you the more you're aware that you know very little. Right. So exactly. you're like, oh my God, there's so much I need to learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, then yeah. the other one for me has to do with memory, which I might not remember the notion anymore. But if I study the reasoning behind it and why something happens in a certain way, then it's easier for me to remember. So what has happened with that, you know, the funny thing that has happened to me is that I used to be a much better converse conversationalist at parties because I'd have all these notions and things that I know. And now, I don't really remember the notions, but I do know all the boring parts. And so nobody wants to speak to me because I'm just become extremely boring at parties. So I don't go to parties anymore. So <laughs> I can't so, but, believe that. <laughs> but it's it's funny because yes, I agree with with Obi and it, for, with Kevin. And for me, it's these two things is that just kind of being aware that I know very little and also wanting to understand it better so that I can remember it. Wonderful. So, so, uh, so from all of you today. So, um, um, Cheryl, so Sergey uh, Rachmaninoff. Yeah, I love I love classical music. Uh, I can't say I'm an expert, but uh, uh, but he his quote is um, music is enough for a lifetime, but a lifetime is not enough for music. And I feel like that about plants. Yeah. And na nature. Right. Great. I've learned so much from all of you today. Uh, believe it or not, I write historical fiction and autobiographical uh, and just regular fiction. Um, and some of the things you have said today um, are going to help me beef up the ecological portions of the things that I write. Um, so I appreciate that. And let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Nico? Sure, we do have some questions that um, come directly from Obi, specific to Kevin and Viola, but I do want to extend um, this conversation a little bit because when it comes to research, I know that a lot of writers are kind of stuck in the um, morass of too much information, right? And so um, one thing that I heard from another researcher author was you have to kind of allow yourself to curate your dinner uh, your, 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 your dinner table and imagine your dinner table with like the most important researchers or the most important people that you are influenced by. So in the in this dinner party with if you can only have such a big table enough to accommodate maybe like three or four other people, who is at your dinner party when it comes to like the people who influence your research? Who would like to take that on first? Um, I, I, uh, I have something to say. Um, this book just came out this week. Uh, it's called The Forgetters by Greg Saris. He's my he's my uh, podcast co-host. And, and we get together once a month on a podcast called Place and Purpose. He's the chairman of the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria out of Santa Rosa. And this ah. is stories of his people, the Southern Pomo and Coastal Miwok that he has stewarded. He's also a professor of literature from Stanford. So he's a he's a masterful writer and a, and a brilliant voice towards uh, towards uh, 
what I think is something very salient in in what in some of the themes we're getting at here today, which is which is the ecological voice in terms of uh, some sort of relationship to uh, one another, to to the future and to the past. Even the idea of remembering, which is which is sort of core to some of the wisdom that pours through these pages here. It's like uh, the 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 there's nothing that's ever truly discovered that it's all just an act of remembering in this idea of uh fully uh acknowledging the past in order to move forward into the future especially in the face of so much injustice and so much and so much uh uh quite frankly forgetting or or suppressing of of uh x y or z uh, is is a process is a process of, of of isolation and so and so this this larger idea of uh inclusion inclusion towards this uh this 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 ability to know where one is in terms of cultural memory in terms of ecological memory uh that uh, you we were talking about this uh, just a moment ago, this 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 idea of of how do I remember it? How do I bring this into myself? How do I encapsulate this knowledge so that I might be able to to digest it, even metabolize it? To to use a, another culinary metaphor, there. <laughs> hmm. I see, Viola, you you had you wanted to respond. I saw you. Pop yes, up. I was um I was thinking about that. It's funny because I was just in Italy for a, a conference of women in food. And that was one of the questions that I was asked on a stage is what, who, who would you have um, that inspires your research and what you write? So um, for me, it depends. I don't know that I have like um, a hero of all times, but it depends on what I'm thinking the most at any particular moment. And what has been pretty foremost on my mind is um, how um, this post-feminist wave, which is like, you know, the third, fourth, fifth post-feminist wave, um, is is uh, taking us in a, is as sees us taking the kitchen back, right? So uh, I think that the first, uh, the first stage of feminism, of which my mother was a part, um, kind of rejected the whole, you know, the whole homemaking and being in the kitchen and the kitchen is the soul of the, uh, the soul of the home. And now we're taking it back and we are making it a place of not just joy, but also we're taking this joy and we're making it into um, entrepreneurship. We're making it into our work, which is what I have done. Um, and so I, right now, I relate to um, a lot of women who do that or they write about that or they think about that. Um, and also I am discovering the feminists of my generation, in Italy especially, because um, feminism in Italy looks very different than, than it does here. So I would say that there, there is at least uh, two feminist writers in Italy whom I would love at my table. Um, one of them, unfortunately, it passed away, so I can no longer have her. Uh, the other one is a young feminist called... Um, Giulia Paganelli, and she talks a lot about fat phobia. She she uh, herself lives in a fat body, so she she talks quite a bit about that, and she does bring food into the into the equation and and what it means and um and the um just the relationship of of carrying the body that she does in the environment in which she lives, and so um it, I just love listening to her, and and I made friends with her actually at this conference but i had i had been a fan for a long time so i would definitely want her because this is foremost on my mind and it's informing the way that i write um i also of course in terms of communication um julia child because i think she was one of the first to really um break things down for people break things down for people and say you know you can you can do this this isn't that complicated and you can do it and so her communication style is absolutely precious to the way that we have all learned how to write about food. Um, and then, you know, any, any one that makes <laughs> really excellent food, any, um, I think producers are more my thing than chefs, the restaurant chefs. They are the ones that I really relate to. 
Um, and so listening to what their process is, how they get there. Um, and that of course helps me quite a bit with my research and with what I, what I talk about and about talking of it knowledgeably and credibly. Wonderful. And, and for, and for me, um, someone I, I haven't met is, uh, Susan Simard, uh, who wrote uh, Finding the Mother Tree. Um, I so much enjoyed, uh, the book and I've obviously read many of her papers and so on and I'm fascinated by um, what goes on uh, beneath the uh, surface of the soil and, and indeed on the surface of the soil and um, that's a book I thoroughly recommend but I enjoyed not only the the science and what she's discovered and others and obviously it's it's ongoing as well we're still learning and um, but also her journey uh, from childhood you know through to you know today um, of people I do know, um, Mikonori Ogisu, who's a, a, a Japanese botanist and plant explorer. Um, and uh, I, I'm proud to say he's a friend. And uh, we, we meet uh, not, not as often as, as I'd like, but he works tires, tirelessly um, in uh, searching and, and plant exploring in China, uh, China specifically. Um, and it's fascinating to hear him speak of um, areas that he's visited uh, in the past, only to return to continue his surveying and indeed finding new species and, 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 and new plants, um, only to find that uh, you know, there's deforestation or development or uh, agriculture has taken over. Um, and he carries that as a burden. He, he feels a pressure um and uh and, and you know he's in his 70s now but he feels a pressure to 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 continue that work with the chinese authorities of course and various universities um but it's palpable when you speak to him that 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 almost that responsibility that you know if if he if he's not there if he doesn't explore there's going to be species lost to science um that we never even met and um and uh and that's that really you know is really uh brings it home you know how we need to look after this planet and and uh we don't realize always how lucky we are yeah well some wonderful choices um although the question wasn't asked of me i'm going to answer it anyway uh at my table i would have probably my two grandmothers and my mother uh and I would want to get from those women what their ecological connections were, how they felt about it, because they all had gardens. They all loved their fruit trees. They all loved anything that was green and growing or flowing. Uh, and I would, I would have, I would have them at the dinner table with me since they're no longer with me. I'd certainly bring them back and talk to them. Hmm. So do we have any more questions from the audience? We do. Um, I'm going to um, highlight Denise's question because it is for all of you. What is sort of the role of faith in the life of a writer slash activist? How do you care for yourself and prevent burnouts? Um, and she also says thanks and many blessings. How about you, Viola? I, I wrote a little something back to Denise, but for me, the burnout is prevented by the fact that my work has many facets. So writing is one of them teaching is another and I also lead food tours in Italy so I spend a lot of time interacting with people because I set up these tours um, and so I don't get burnt out because I don't really experience the sense of isolation that a lot of writers have to deal with um, so yeah so that is one way and then the other is also that I spend a lot of time with my senses because that for me that is the best way to teach people is to tell them um, what the body should feel like in relationship to the food as it changes on their stove and in their kitchen. Every kitchen is its own. My stove is not going to be the same as yours, Cheryl, the same as right. uh, your Kevin's. So you cannot tell people, oh, just have it at, you know, medium fire or have it five right. minutes because, you know, we're all using different pots, different stoves. And so I always um, spend a lot of time thinking of the relationship between me and the food and and I give this kind of directions in the book so for me that is um, how I prevent burnout now on the faith part of Denise's um, question 
I am uh, rather faithless, unfortunately. So, I mean, unfortunately, just the way it is. I'm, I'm a, I, I am a convinced atheist, so I don't really uh, put a lot of thought into that. Okay. How about you, Obi? I think that uh, that that faith can, it operates uh, in 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 non-religious realms as well. Uh, that uh, especially in terms of 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 policy, uh, my my work often my work as a writer and an artist, I, I, I often find myself being a science communicator or a policy communicator, and so much. Uh, environmental policy is built on assumptions that we have yet to verify uh, in the environmental sciences, such as the idea of uh, essential habitat connectivity, which, which governs so much uh, wildlife management across the state, is built on the idea that there is such a thing as essential connectivity, as if there is a lower limit to the parameter that is somehow a laundry list of ingredients that X, Y, or Z species need uh, in order to exist at all into some indeterminate future based on these vectors of stress that seem legion as they seem mounted against uh, the expressed biodiversity of any given habitat and are so 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 readily slipping away to to uh, simplification, the op the opposite mm -hmm. of diversity, and mm -hmm. and I believe that this is one of the great uh, assumptions that that if if proven false uh, would be would be perhaps even a greater undoing than than even those presented by the climate crisis as it is uh, the the. Uh, the sim simple ecosystems are the most fragile. It is only in greater diversity does resiliency manifest in its strongest forms. Exactly. Um, Kevin? And, so, yeah. and, and for, for me, for me, um, it's interesting because my whole life is plants. So um, in business, I'm growing plants, I'm discovering plants. Uh, my colleague is breeding plants and um, but when growing plants, uh, of course, things go wrong. Um, we use biological control to control the pest and disease. Um, so we don't use chemicals. And um, and of course, if a, if a, a large crop is uh, damaged or disfigured by a pest, then that's very stressful because it can't go to market. Um, but at the same time, I can have a very stressful day at work and that stress may have come from plants, normally people, but sometimes plants or pest and disease. But my relaxation is very much being in the garden uh, or in nature, but certainly in, gar in the garden, walking around the garden, looking at the plants, of course, uh, being a plant nerd, many are rare and unusual from all around the world and seeing how they're growing. And, uh, and that, that brings, brings me back uh, and grounds me and relaxes me. Um, with regard to faith, also I, I have no faith, but I'm very interested in in the stories, as I keep mentioning, behind trees and plants. So in the book, in our book, the story of trees that I wrote with my friend and colleague David West, um, it's very interesting to to reflect on on um, on faith. You know, whether it's the uh, uh, Nordic faith in in in, in trees um, and um, uh, and so many different religions of course that's part of the stories behind these trees and uh the epic of gilgamesh written four thousand years ago and mm. uh, elements uh reflected in the epic of gilgamesh that that um uh, were shared also in the bible um and have great parallels adam and eve and and, and different stories that you can you can trace back uh, much further um, and and the connection with with trees and, and nature um, and the intricate web of stories and um, and and belief and and uh, behind all these plants and how they've been treasured throughout you know humankind. I, I want to uh, ask uh, each of you a final question, really uh, for the writers out there who are listening in. What advice would you give to the writers out there who want to write about ecology? Kevin? 
uh, I believe personally, when Arthur and I uh, set about writing Edible, um, we wanted to highlight uh, challenges and, and we're all very well aware of climate change and the challenges that presents. Um, and not to mention um, political unrest and wars and so on and so forth and the, the chaos it causes to, 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 to people and the planet. Um, but we wanted to present um, uh, positivity um, and, and uh, so that people felt that they can make a difference. And uh, I, I believe that's very important in uh, ecological writing that um, because as we all know, many of us and many people suffer from um, anxiety around climate change and a, a feeling of hopelessness and, and and but we all have a role to play as we know of course and um and and we can you know i know it's often said but we can make a difference and and, and being well informed through the writings of so many people uh, across so many uh, uh areas of expertise um we can all learn and be inspired uh as to what we can do and and enjoying enjoying what we've got and helping to conserve it and it's that begins outside the front door as far as i'm concerned you know what's that tree what's that tree in the street you know um uh, there's a taxis to the yew tree um which which um is an ancient tree and can live for many thousands of years um and and i'm just as fascinated by the the yew trees outside hampton court palace um uh and and the history there as i am one outside a local supermarket that's recently been built um and before the supermarket was the police station before that it was the um the the, the dock workers uh housing and they were the dock workers that that you know would have helped load the titanic because i live near southampton where the titanic uh ah. sets from so so you know, just looking at a tree like that, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, a very famous tree um, uh, that, that, that's very well recorded and documented. It can be that tree in your street. What's the history behind that tree? And and to me, uh, that's what we can do in our writing, uh, go way beyond um, exactly. uh, sharing the concerns and the problems, but really offering some hope and some solutions that we can all join in. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Viola. So I don't, I'm not sure that I can say that I write specifically about ecology. So this is a, a tough one for me, but I do have some, a suggestion for myself. My next, uh, uh, my next book is going to be on vegetables. So, so I think what I'm going to do is I am going to befriend uh, Kevin and or Obi mm. even further. And we're going to write a book together where they grow the vegetables and then I cook them. So that's what, <laughs> Fantastic. I, that's what I think is going to happen. Now, wait just one minute. And then you invite me over so yes. I can eat them. Yeah. So we're okay. doing the, a four-hand book here. I so love it. Eight set of hands writing one book. I cannot think of anything better. I love it. <laughs> Obi? I, I'm very excited about what you know, the next 50, 100 years means for ecological science, for ecological awareness, for ecological writing. Uh, I find, as I, as I said, you know, the act of communication tends to, tends to have, to have me sort of uh, skirting with even the identity of something like a journalist, of something like the, the translation from one realm of thought to the other. Uh, but, but I tell you, I believe that we are, we are just about to see the new Darwin and she is out there and she is, she is young and she is dreaming of experiments that we, that we don't know yet. What we don't know in ecology dwarfs what we do. Like, uh, for, you know, for example, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, we understand that like. A genotype follows phenotype. That means like we, we understand genetic heredity and natural selection, but we don't really understand why leaves have different shaped leaves. Right. Why tree right. species have different shaped leaves. You know, it's 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 why hasn't that ever been like right. optimized, for example? Or why why is it different within the same habitat space? You know, so like these kind of like really simple or de deceptively simple questions. That's that's a very complex question to ask. And and 
the world of evolutionary biology, for example, is is replete with them. And I think that this new Darwin will uh, reveal to us not not something like uh, nature written tooth and claw, like Tennyson said, but rather as the research of Susan Samard, Kevin mentioned her earlier, um, the idea of the mother tree, the idea that inside of ecological processes, the the idea of cooperation is at least as important as the idea of competition and to quantify that is uh is is still is still elusive and perhaps there are social implications to such a, a an analysis that could really be revolutionary in so many ways ah uh, you guys are so deep mm. <laughs> thank you so and, much and and, 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 and enjoy uh, anyone anyone considering writing a book should you know I, I enjoy it so much. And for me, I like to co-write books. I mean, the, the story of trees and edible were are my books, my ideas, but I, I ask you know, colleagues to join me in that journey. And, and that's what it is for me. It's, a, it's, a, it's about that friendship and that journey together. And on edible, um, the illustrator is a farmer in Oregon and she's ah. Kate, Katie Cooler on a small holding in Oregon. So it's perfect. You know, you've got the plant nerd, uh, you've got the the ecologist and 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 uh, and foodie in Arta, and then Katie, who's actually a grower of edible crops and with her family. And uh, so, and that, and to me, that's so important uh, to enjoy the journey. Thank you so much. Thank you, Viola, Kevin, and Obi. Thank you again, Mechanics Institute, Nico, and Alyssa. And thank you so much, you writers out there, for being with us today. I will turn it back over to Nico. Uh, I just want to invite all of our participants to join our virtual ecology here today. If you feel uh, comfortable, if you can unmute yourself and give your warm thank yous to our wonderful panelists today and also show your faces if you feel comfortable and sort of give, you know, like we, we are at a beautiful, beautiful dinner table today and we get to over hear what Obi, Kevin, Viola have to share with us today. So we are very blessed to be at that dinner table. I'm also going to be popping into our chat box, the link for our next writer's lunch on May 17th on crafting books and um, stories for youth and children on May 17th. So we welcome you to join us. And I do think we are over time. So I'm gonna honor everyone's time and end our writer's lunch today. Um, also, Viola, Kevin, and Obi, do feel free to reach out to each other to make that um, co-authored book happen. Mm. This is the point of this is to be be able to connect like-minded folks together um, who love writing on the same topic. Have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon, and it, it is a blessing to see all of you today. Thank you. See Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.